We've been doing a series, uh, verse by verse. We did 1 Corinthians. We said, well, let's go right on to 2 Corinthians, a natural flow right into that. And Paul, as we know, uh, there was a click in the church. And, and a lot of the reason 1 Corinthians, the letter was written, was to try to resolve some of the problems in the church. In the church in Corinth, there were, I believe, numerous churches that Paul had a part in on his missionary journeys, leading people to Christ, starting churches, ordaining elders in these churches. And he would go back on his trips to see the churches and, and write letters, epistles, to help them uh, with doctrine. Today, we're going to see in 1 through 5 here of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he gives his credentials, his credentials. <laughs> Do you know that uh, we might say even more than credentials, if you go to a college, I know my wife Terry teaches at Hanalani and a lot of the kids graduate now, and they want a letter of recommendation. Do you ever have anybody do that for you? And usually when you write a letter of recommendation, you want sometimes you, you want to be as nice as possible. Not, you're not lying, but you, know, you want to really embellish some of the things. You know, little Johnny is one of my best students. He would be an asset to your school, extremely smart, you know, and on and on it goes. Well, Paul is going to talk about these recommendations and credentials because they were questioning. They were, que can you imagine questioning Paul <laughs> that he was a man of God, that he was called of God to do the work of God. There were people in that church that he had uh, serious issues with. And he's uh, addressing that here. And we're going to talk about uh, three of the credentials and the recommendations here and, he, and what they really are not. He's talking about things that are not things that he does not need but what he has from the Lord. And you have it as well. When you're called of God, I believe God calls a man into a ministry. It's a call, we say, to prepare. Most of you that are attending Bob Jones, Pensacola, I've heard some of the other schools. There are many, many good schools. You're, you're called to train. We uh, usually say this. A call to the ministry is a call to be with Christ. When he called his disciples, he called them to be with him. And so it's a call for a personal ministry with the Lord and call to a place of service. You know what? It's not just about geography saying, well, God's calling me to China or God's calling me to Philippines. You, you do what God called you to do where you are right now. Amen. Uh, these young people from all over the country, the mainland, all the world, Chicago, is that a country? And so they come, <laughs> just kidding, and they, they serve the Lord. Now they're in Hawaii. They're here and they're at Camp Capono. And I used to tell people this, and we say it here all the time. If you're not going to serve the Lord here in, in, uh, in Wahiwa, where we are, well, you're not going to all of a sudden go to Bible college and become, you know, uh, the second coming of Charles Spurgeon. Do, do it here and, and continue to do it wherever God calls you. But Paul, uh, and you know, when, when, when they called me here to be the pastor, it's two and a half years now, they will look at your, uh, Paul says, credentials and recommendations. He says commendation. Uh, and, and, and they lo looked at my credentials. See, he's Italian-American. He's from Jersey City, uh, 60 years old. Bam! No, <laughs> they said, uh, we, we think uh, we line up with the doctrine and what we believe to be true about the Bible and about the Lord. And so uh, we consider these things. And Paul, again, shouldn't have to, but in a lot of these letters he's writing, he's defending himself. Number one, he wants to let us know. We have four quick points here and we'll be done. The minister's credentials are not what they're not. They're not letters of recommendation, Paul's saying. He said, what does it say that? Look at verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Do we begin again to command or recommend ourselves, Paul's saying, or need we, as some others, letters or epistles of recommendation to you or letters of recommendation from you? Do we need to do that? There were those in the church, they accused Paul of pride, as acting as if he was the, capital T-H-E, the only messenger of God, more special than any other messenger. This is what they accused him of. That he was claiming that what he was saying to them was the word of God itself, and what others were saying was less than the word of God. Again, he was accused of it. Praising himself, exalting himself, pride above others. That's what he was accused of. And last week we said, Paul wrote in chapter 2, that he did not corrupt the word of God as others had done. And his ministry was based on a true calling of God. It should be. And he knew that those that opposed him were going to jump on, again, his claim here. That he's claiming, again, that he is sent of God and, and, and he is commended of God. 
and that he does not need the recommendation of men. And again, he's not saying a cocky or proud. He's just stating the facts. But he knew people in that church, again, a small group and clique, we're going to accuse him of things. The question is, why should the Corinthians or anyone else, again, people would say this about Paul, why, why should they listen to him? Why should we say that he is called of God? What credentials does he have? In answering the question and establishing his credentials, there's one basic truth Paul said to them here. The minister's credentials, what they are not, they are not letters of recommendation. Men uh, always have and always will place confidence in a letter or a commendation or a letter of recommendation. Not bad things, but as all people know, these letters are often exaggerated and, and uh, not the real deal. I don't think you really get to know somebody until you work alongside them. Uh, we um, uh, had an office in Florida when I was a chiropractor, and we would hire people to work with us, whether they were uh, greeting people at the door, whether they were doing insurance work, whether they did physical therapy, and uh, they had uh, brought letters with them of commendation or recommendation. And when you read these letters, it's like, wow, I got the best person in the whole world here that's uh, wanting to work at the Cuso Chiropractic Clinic, you know? But the truth is, when you work with somebody for a while, you're going to find out if, uh, if, if what the letter says is true. But Paul is saying he didn't need letters of recommendation. There was other people maybe that did, but uh, these things are often exaggerated. Paul says some in the Corinthian church had used letters of recommendation for themselves in the past, all right? But he didn't need that. The minister's letters of recommendation are not the primary credentialing. I know I, I, they had asked me, you know, where I went to church before, the people that were in the leadership there, the deacons and elders of the church, where I went to college, Crown College. I don't know if they called Pastor Sexton. Um, maybe they did. Maybe they called where I went to church in Florida. In other words, to get this recommendation. And Paul's saying here, number one, the first credential of the minister is this. Not necessarily handwritten letters by someone that speak very highly, but the first credential of a minister are the lives written upon his heart. Look at verse 2. 2 Corinthians 3, 2, he says, you, ye, are our epistles. I don't need letters of recommendation. He says, the people in that church in Corinth that I led to Christ, that we helped to grow in Christ and establish their faith, you are our epistles, written in our hearts. And then he says this, known and read of all men. Two things here. First, Paul says the Corinthian believers that he knew were written on his heart. <laughs> Anyone who knew Paul could see he loved and cared for these people, many of whom he led probably personally to Christ. And he was always praying for them and expressing love and care for them. He cherished them. They were dear to him, so dear that he would say these words, you are our epistles written in our hearts. Do you have anybody that's been written in your heart? I'm not talking about a boyfriend or girlfriend, or anything like that, romantic. I'm talking about someone maybe that you led to Christ and that you took under your wing and you discipled them and you taught them the Word of God and you showed them uh, things to do and not to do, how to behave as a Christian, how to act, again, from the Word of God. They're written in your hearts. Do you have anybody like that? Paul said, we have, that's my credentials. That's what I'm going to stand upon. The lives, the changed lives of people that I had uh, dealt with. They're here. They're in my heart. That's where they're written. People are more important than written letters. Now, not that written letters are wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm glad that they checked me out here. I'm glad they found out some things about me. <laughs> you say, well, I'm glad they didn't find out this about me. No, I'm glad they found out about me. You, you have to do that. This is just part of a basic thing. But what Paul was saying is, there's people in the church there that are accusing me of things that are not true. He says, I'll tell you what, more important than letters of recommendation are these lives that are written on my heart. People had written upon his heart. People that he loved and cared for. People he led to the Lord. People he matured in Christ. This is the true letter of commendation that should matter to the people in the Corinthian church, again, in Paul's case. A heart that has people written on it. Do you have people written on your heart? <laughs> We used to say to kidding around, uh, I was the president of a little league, we say, man, if it wasn't for these parents, we'd have a great time here, you know, coaching these kids, these complaining parents. Well, if it wasn't for the people in the church, we'd have a great church. Well, without the people, we wouldn't have a church. <laughs> we have people. You have to be a people person. You know, every Christian says, I'm not, I'm not really good with people. I'm not social. I don't speak good. I don't talk good. If you're a Christian, you have to have the same love in your heart that God had 
prosperous for lost sinners. You love them. We love people to Christ. I know they're sinners. I know they're going to die without Christ and go to a, an eternity, a, a separation. The Bible calls it the second death, of course. And we're not to go and, 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 and sin alongside them to lead them to Christ and partake of their sin. But we have to have a love. And so when you lead somebody to Christ, now you love them as a brother or a sister in Christ. That's what they are spiritually, right? They're in the family. And you take them and you, they're written on your heart. Do you have people that you think right now in your mind that you knew and even from the past, they're in your heart. They're going to be there. They may not even be with you. They may be in a, another location far away, but they're written on your heart. That was the case here with Paul. Secondly, Paul says this was a fact that was known and read by all men. <laughs> Anyone could look at the lives of these people Paul had written on their heart and knew that, that there was something about him that was real because of their lives. Now, this, you could say this about parents and children. You could say, wow, you know, that, that child came from a good home right? because the parents love and care for them. You could see it in their lives. That's what Paul was saying to them. There's my letter of recommendation. You, you're my letter. Your life and how you're living is my letter of recommendation. Their testimony, their growth in the Lord. A minister's greatest commendation are the changed lives of people. Amen? I know uh, Brother Matt here, pastors there in New Jersey. People that he's seen have grown in the Lord. He's here in Hawaii right now, but I know as a pastor, he's probably thinking, I wonder how they're doing back there in the church service. You always think that. It's your, your flock. Those are the people you are the under-shepherd, and you, you're concerned about them. You care about them. That's why when somebody messes up, you think that it's good and the pastor's happy and, it, and oh, he's upset. Why? Just like a parent with a child. We love them. We don't want to see them, uh, their lives wrecked and ruined. They're written on our heart. We care about them. A minister's greatest commendation, we said, a changed lives of people. Growing in Christ. You know, Terry had something that she did on Facebook. She said, I'm a little hesitant to write this thing there about asking former students, is there anything you can remember that you learned in school here, particularly from my class, that has, that has done something and helped you in your life. You know, you want to you know that people, again, not for our own pride, but that people, you have affected their lives. I know Terry's always saying, I'm, I'm, she's always going, I'm, who's that? Who are you talking to? One of my former students. I don't know how many she has, hundreds of thousands, but she stays in touch with them. It's a good thing. Listen, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, Paul said, am, not, am I not an apostle? Because they were questioning that. Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And then he says this, Are not you my work in the Lord? He said, If I be not an apostle, doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship, he says, are you in the Lord. It was the people and the lives that he touched. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, Paul said, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? That's the question mark. What is it? He says, Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Others, that's what it's all about. Paul is writing here again, defending himself. He shouldn't have to, right? He's Paul, <laughs> but he had to because of people in that church. The second credential of the minister are the lives written by Christ. By Christ. So you're giving all the credit to the pastors here. Because well, I am a pastor, but it's not that. It's all about Christ, not about me. He said these are lives written by Christ through the minister. We're just a conduit. God works through us, not because, in spite of us most times. 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, he said, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. Then he says this, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. It's a crucial point here. Listen, the minister is not the one who converts and changes the lives of people. Amen? First, it's Christ and Christ alone who converts and grows people. The lives of believers here in Corinth, he said, you are the letter of Christ. You're the epistles of Christ. Christ is the author of your faith. 
He's the, he's the author of your conversion, your salvation, your righteousness. Any good thing we have is from Christ. We have that imputed righteousness. Whatever change we have, whatever joy, love, peace, assurance, all due to Christ. The lives of believers, again, it's not ink, <laughs> written with ink, but the Spirit of the living God. You know, I often tell people when they get saved, we want them to remember what they did. We said, you know, you have a marriage certificate somewhere. It tells you the date and the time and the place. This is proof that you were married. This is your salvation certificate. Amen, right here. You have God's word as proof that you're married. Not necessarily written with ink, all right, but it's on, on your heart. And, you know, we know when we get saved, God's spirit comes to live in our body temple. Amen. God himself, 24-7, lives with us, never leave us or forsake us. So the lives of believers, Paul's saying, are not written with ink, which men use, but the spirit of the living God. Christ uses the Holy Spirit when he wishes to communicate the message to men. Jesus wrote in John chapters 14 and 16 all about the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. He said, I am going to go to the cross, I'm going to die, be raised again, but it's expedient. They were all upset that he was leaving, but he said, no, it's good for you. It's expedient that I leave, because if I don't leave, then the Holy Spirit won't come, and the Holy Spirit has come, amen? On the fleshly tables of your heart, when you're saved, the message is in your heart. Secondly, it's the minister who ministers, serves in the lives of believers. But Christ does all the work. Ministered by us, Paul said. Paul's saying Christ creates the letter, converts the believer, and we look after it. We're stewards, amen, of all that Christ has done in the heart of a man and a woman or a teen. The greatest commendation that a minister can have is not the letters written by ink, but Christ written in the lives of people, amen? Hopefully multitudes and the Spirit of the living God, written in their conduct and behavior, and the law of God written upon their, their hearts. How are they going to get the law of God into their hearts? They have to read it. They have to study it. They have to meditate upon it. Number four, last, the third credential of the minister is being qualified and made fit by God. <laughs> Say, well, I went to Pensacola. People up here, I went to Bob Jones. I went to Crown, the Crown College in Knoxville, Tennessee, the best school in the country. <laughs> Just kidding, come on. But, <laughs> but here's the thing. We are qualified by God himself, and so are you, amen? Look at verse 4 and 5, 2 Corinthians 3. And such trust have we through Christ to God, what he says. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, he said, but our sufficiency is what? Is of God. Two points here, and we'll be done. First, he was made fit for the ministry through Christ. He says, such trust we have through Christ. He was not sufficient himself for the ministry, right? His only sufficiency was through Christ and God. He could not make himself, I cannot make myself fit for the ministry, even if I had willed it to be so. I, we have no power, humanly speaking, to change the heart of a person, to give life, spiritual life. We don't have it to give to a person. We don't have the Holy Spirit of God to indwell a person and to write the law of God on their hearts. Only Christ can do that. Amen? Only Christ can qualify and equip and fit the minister to share God's word with people. The gift of life and the power to give life is God and God alone. Paul's telling them that. These, uh, this is the reasons that we are qualified. We have the commendation of changed lives. We have the qualification of being made fit and qualified by God himself. And then secondly, he uses that word to Godward in verse 4. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. The word means that the minister serves God and he serves before God, before the gaze and inspection of God. The minister is not only qualified and made fit by God, but he's responsible to God, how he ministers. We have to answer to a higher power, amen? The minister has no greater commendation in the fact that he's qualified and fitted for the ministry by both Christ and God. So I feel God's leading me to serve him and be full-time, whatever. Again, I, I hate that word sometimes, but you know, when you're saved, you're in the ministry. We like to say, well, I'm full-time, I'm just a member of the church. No, you're, you're full-time everybody when you're saved. You're not just saved to serve on Sunday mornings, you know, Sunday night and Wednesday night. You're full-time, we're all full-time. But you know, when I say in the ministry, we mean that's your, your occupation, you could say. That, that's what you're doing for the Lord 
and nothing else. He will equip you. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4 says Christ gave gifts to the church. Remember apostles, prophets, and then evangelists, pastors, and teachers to do what? To equip the saints, that's you, for the work of the ministry. And that's what we're to do. We, we fit them. It's like taking a, an old couch and you've got to you know, take all the old material off, put some new cushioning in there, make it nice and strong, tighten it up there, put a new covering on it. Now it's ready to be sat upon. <laughs> well, we are equipped and fit and made ready by the Lord himself, by his spirit, through his word, of course, through study. But it's Godward. We're serving him. <laughs> we have to answer to him. And uh, to whom much is given, the Bible says much is required. We're required to be, it's a found faith in the steward. He'd be found what? Faithful. Faithful. The point here Paul makes is striking when he's talking about these commendations, these letters that these people were, again, questioning him, questioning his qualifications. He's saying a minister's credentials are the presence and power of Christ in his life. You people will you'll be known not because well he's tall uh, got the red hair he's got blue eyes uh, a lot of people say this about ministers and preachers uh, I like the way he speaks <laughs> uh, I, I could listen to him for a thousand hours you know without falling asleep whatever that that has nothing to do with a minister being made fit by God nothing at all that's your personal preference and that's great I'm glad you have your favorite speakers and all that kind of thing and your pastor should be your favorite speaker amen but the thing is this God and Christ will equip you but here's the thing how much time are you spending with him <laughs> and so it's not just a pretty face <laughs> it's not just an amazing body <laughs> It's not hair or lack of. <laughs> it's not your accent. <laughs> God will enable you as you give in to him and surrender to him. We want to be used. We want to be used by the Lord. And we have to surrender. You know the biggest problem we have in the ministry? It's pride. It's the biggest problem we all have to deal with. The person that we look at in the mirror every day. Have you surrendered and died to self and giving your life to the Lord. Paul did that. Paul, again, had these people. Ye, he said, plural, you. You are our credentials. You're written in my heart. Change lives. Again, Paul's not trying to take the credit for this. He's just letting the people that are against him and accusing him know. Just check out my converts. <laughs> Paul uh, loved these people. He wanted what's best for the church. He, of course, was very tough on the church and rebuked the church. Hey, parents, you love your children. You're going to correct them, but love them as well and spend time. It's the parent's job to raise the child. It's, it's the person you lead to Christ. It's your job to train that new convert and disciple them. John chapter 3, verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Your talent is only good if you use it for the Lord. If not, it's a waste. I say, well, this person's good at this. He sings good. He's smart. Good. That's great. All things to be used by the Lord. John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5, Jesus said this. I love John chapter 15. If ye abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. Just take the branch off the tree that has a nice orange going on. See how long it's going to last. He said, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. And then he says this, for without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. You're going to be working this week with teenagers, right? At the camp? Oh, baby. <laughs> Better you than me. No, listen. You, you love these kids. You love them. They, they may come to you from bad homes. They have gone through some maybe terrible things in their lives that nobody knows about but them and God. And they're, 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 they're hoping to come to camp maybe to get away from it all. Some of the kids need to get away from things. TV, video games, cell phones, and just concentrate and hear from the Lord. And you're going to be there. You're going to represent God and Christ before these teenagers this week, right? Like you did last week before the junior age kids. Just know this, that Christ and God is enabling you. He gives you what you need 
to meet the needs that they have as you yield yourself to him. Have you done that? Have you done that? This is what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy, and I'm going to be done with this verse. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. This is what Paul said. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me. That's who we have to thank. For he counted me faithful, putting me, putting me into the ministry. You, you, you counselors from Camp Capone, you're, you're in the ministry, so I'm going to be a medical student. I'm going to be a nurse. I'm going to be a prison man. Or somebody said uh, law enforcement, right? A couple, how many law enforcement? Go to Jersey City. You're needed there. No. <laughs> but the thing is this. Or no matter what your occupation, no matter what career path that you choose or God's chosen for you, you serve the Lord, amen, wherever you're at. But maybe God's calling someone to, we call again, full-time ministry, pastor, missionary. He's going to enable you as, again, as you surrender. <laughs> He's looking for tender, soft hearts, lives that he can mold like a piece of clay that's soft and moldable. Sometimes we're a little hard. <laughs> Jersey City, we're a little rough around the edges, so God takes the chisel, you know. He has to do it. All right, I don't like this thing right here. Oh, it's a little tough. Oh, bam! Oh, this Kuzo guy, he's a little tough. He, bam! He's got to hit us a few times with the hammer. So, ah, he finally listened. He finally gave in to what I want for his life. Again, I don't know. Anything in your life we don't know about, God knows, you know. You want to serve the Lord. He wants you. He needs you. He wants you. You say, God needs me? Not really, but... He needs us to serve. Angels can't do what we do. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Has every person heard the gospel, been reached with the gospel? I don't think so. Not yet. So even in this age with communication and computers, there's still people that haven't heard the true gospel of Christ. And that's what we're to do as a church. Churches. Maybe God's speaking to your heart. Maybe you're here this morning. You don't know if you died right now, you'd go to heaven. Say, I'm not 100% sure. In a minute, we're going to sing a hymn. And then during that hymn, I'm going to be down here in the front. You say, well, maybe I want to come and pray with Pastor Cuzo. If you're a woman, we'll have another lady pray with you. If you're a guy, I'll have myself or another man pray with you about knowing for sure when you die that you can know for sure you're going to go to heaven. We talked to these fellows here when they got back from camp. We picked them up on Friday, 11 o'clock. They couldn't wait until they got in the car and told us about I got saved, and the counselors told us about Jesus dying on the cross for our sin. I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And I prayed, and I received Christ. I mean, we're so excited for them. You could see, you could hear it in their voices. Now, discipleship is just the beginning to see these young men and ladies grow for Christ and do what God's called them to do, whatever it may be. You're here this morning, you're never, again, not sure. If you were to die right now, you'd go to heaven. You can be sure. Again, not because I'm telling you, because God's word says you can be sure. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life, and the wrath of God abideth on him. You're here this morning Say, I'm a Christian. I've been saved. I know it. I trusted Christ maybe years ago, maybe months ago, days ago, hours ago. And you want to pray that the Lord will use you in whatever way. Again, many needs in the Christian world for people to just surrender and serve the Lord. But you just say, I'll, say yes. Pastor Sexton would always say that. He said, before you come to a church service, when you're getting out of your car coming in, you should say yes in your heart to whatever it is the Word of God is going to say. In other words, don't have to come to church and say, well, let me think about it. Mm, no. <laughs> no, say yes before you come in to whatever it is. You never go wrong saying yes to God. Amen? And you would come in a moment if you want. The altar's open. You want to kneel down here and pray privately, or you want someone to pray with you, you let me know. We'll do that. We want to take care of any needs you might have. We appreciate all the visitors that are here this morning. We're, we're grateful to God for you to be here. I know these uh, camp counselors are going to be going back to camp this week and next week and then back to their homes, right? Back to school in August. But we want to pray for them, remember them in prayer, that God will give them souls for their labors. But let's go ahead and I'm going to close in prayer, and then we're going to have the musicians come and play. And it's time for you to, to just make a decision, whatever God's dealing with. If you need help, you want to pray with someone, you come forward, and we'll, we'll help you with that. But let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the uh, Apostle Paul, for the Word of God, for uh, his, uh, again, his inspired words here, Lord, about commendation and about the hearts of people. And he had on his heart lives that were changed. 
because of the gospel, Lord. Help us to be like Paul and, uh, Lord, seeking the lost and having them on our hearts as well. Bless this time now as we want to do what you want us to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother John, please.